Well, good evening. Welcome to the next segment of our Road to State Convention. Um, last week we did a history of the Tom and Don show of Kansas Farmers Union, National Farmers Union. If anybody is interested in viewing it that missed it, it should be available on our website for viewing. Uh, tonight is a wonderful presentation that Rosanna put together and did the whole blooming thing on her own and she got a whale of a list of speakers together. I don't know how she pulled off Mary, but anytime we can get Mary scheming with us and our gang, that's a wonderful thing. And I'll turn it over to her in just a second, but uh, I do want to put a plug in for next week, uh, the next Thursday night, the third segment of our Road to Convention is uh, uh, Sammy Teleton and her and another gal have started a startup company that's working with farmers trying to help them access grants and credit and looks pretty interesting and so she met with our board and the board liked what they heard and so they're the third segment. The fourth segment the next Thursday after that is National Farmers Union. Uh, every state convention, we usually have a Washington breakfast where the NFU representatives there gives us an update on the politics of DC. This one will probably be a little more expanded than that because you're gonna have the full hour, but, but uh, that'll be the fourth segment. Then we go into our state convention, which is the evening of December 3rd, and then the morning of December 5th. Uh, I think I've talked enough. They've got a well of a list of speakers. I'd just like to introduce Rosanna Bauman and thank her for all the work she's done putting this together tonight. All right. Thank you, Don. Um, a short overview of what my goals were for this is, to be honest, um, I'm a farmer and a butcher. And I have just been kind of in survival mode this year. You just go and, and do put out this fire and that fire and, and there's been no time to uh, process anything. And here we are coming in the last quarter of 2020, which is a good thing. Um, the bad thing is that means we're starting 2021. And <laughs> I really hate the fact that like, I'm never sure when we come into the last quarter if I'm supposed to uh, be focusing on um, analyzing my past year or planning for my previous year and it would really help me out if they could be like six months apart and then I would be able to you know focus on one thing and the other but here we are coming into 2021 and I needed a little bit of help analyzing what in the world happened um, on my farm in my butcher shop and to the industry at large this year so that's why I, uh, I wanted to hear from all these different people and their perspectives so that's, that's my goal and I'm excited to hear what I'm gonna learn from this. Um, first up, we have Dr. Mary Hendrickson from Missouri and I'm gonna have a hard time summarizing. Uh, I, I've connected with her over the years in a number of different ways, um, all around food, um, usually local food systems. So um, hearing that she actually spent a good bit of time analyzing the um, meat packing industry or food corporations at large. I was really excited that she could help speak towards that. So she's going to take us off with a little bit of a history lesson. Go ahead, Mary. All right. Thank you, Rosanna. And I am going to share my slides here. And come on. Go. There we go. So, um, I have 10 minutes, so I just started my timer, and I will try to get through this. This is a very short history, and a lot of the folks that are on the webinar tonight might know this history, but you know, we can go back to the you know early part of the 20th century, and we saw the growth of the big packers that were associated with the stockyards and places like Chicago and Omaha and things like that. We broke them up. You know, we broke them up in the in the um, 1920s. We had the Packers and Stockyards Act, and for a while, you know, the 1920s to the 1960s, 
Um, we had a fair diversity of small packs, um, small packing houses around, especially around the Midwest that were um, regionally um, dispersed. Uh, they weren't, uh, they were in a lot of little towns and so on. But we started to see things happen again in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I'm gonna walk us through that just a little bit. So I found this graph from um, one of my um, tongue-in-cheek favorite economists, Mark Drabenstadt, um, who was at the Federal Reserve um, about 20 years ago, uh, the Federal Reserve in Kansas City. And he put the, they put this graph together looking at what was happening in meat processing in um, the, the 1990s and 2000s, um, or looking back actually. And you can see that in steers and heifers, we were around 40% of the market was, um, uh, the top four firms had about 40% of the market share in the, um, um, in, 1982. So these blue are all 1982 and, and steers and heifers, just a little over 40%. And then you see it's almost doubles by 1999. So in less than 20 years, you see this doubling. In hogs, you see a steady creep up from 40% up to 60%. In broilers, you see that those creep up and you're like, well, what's, what's really going on here? Um, we are, as a sociologist, um, I'm interested in, um, power and power relationships. And one of the things that we know is that when four or fewer farms firms control 40% or more of a given market, you know, they don't even have to collude formally or anything. Like they just watch because there's just a few players in the marketplace. And really this constrains a lot of options for farmers, but it constrains options all the way through the food chain. Um, and now we see what's happening, and uh, I'm not sure that you can see the top of this, um, but um, in, uh, 19, in, in 2011, we were at 82% um, of, so roughly between 99 and in that next decade and on, you know, beef slaughters held fairly constant in the upper 70% for the top four firms. Pork slaughter in, is a little over 60%, has held uh, steady. Broiler slaughter over 50%, turkey slaughter over 58%. But you can see that these things, you know, we went from 31 to 58. We went um, in 1990, we had 31% of the turkey slaughter owned by the top or controlled by the top four firms. Um, and so this is the most, um, this is a, a ranking from the middle about 2015. Um, and one thing that you should notice is that the CR4 is holding st fairly steady, but what we're also seeing is we're seeing some change in ownership. So if you go back here, you can see that there was this company called IBP, we're gonna talk about in a, in a little bit, and ConAgra. By the time you get to 2011 and on, you don't see ConAgra anymore, they're out of this business. You don't see Smithfield until, you know, um, until the, um, um, 1990s because they bought Morel and, and places like that. But you start to see these, these uh, large, inter really integrated firms um, arise. And a place like Smithfield is acting much more like a poultry firm where it has a lot of its own sows, a lot of sows under contract, but a lot of its own sows as well. And of course, by um, the late aughts, Smithfield was bought by WH Foods, um, a Chinese firm, and it is still owned by WH Foods. Um, Tyson um, is still around. J uh, uh, JBS has bought Pilgrim's Pride, and so you see that um, you'll you'll see JBS and Tyson. JBS is a is a firm from um, um, Brazil, and both uh, my colleague at um, uh, to Michigan State, Phil Howard, has done some work on showing how JBS, which is the world's largest beef packer, um, has uh, really gained from their relationship, uh, I guess I could call it a relationship, with the uh, Brazilian government. Um, Smithfield, which is owned by WH Group, WH Group was able to buy Smithfield on a huge loan and um, that was just uh, given to the uh, um, company, like basically approved overnight because of their relationship with the Chinese government. 
Um, and so how do we get here? How do we get to this very consolidated system, right? Where did we get to where Smithfield Foods has a plant in uh, South Dakota that processes 19,000 pigs a day? And that's like um, about 4% of the, of, the, um, daily, of the slaughter capacity. How do we get to this place where, you know, think about that. 4% of the, of the slaughter capacity for pigs moves through one plant. And when it was shut down um, with COVID early on in the COVID crisis, it backed things up badly. So how do we get here? How do we go from a place where we had a lot of small um, um, butcher shops, but also just a lot of small packing companies scattered across Iowa and Kansas and Nebraska and so on? Well, um, IBP was really the innovator of the 1960s. And what IBP did was it relocated plants closer to the supply of animals. So what you'd had is you had um, a lot of processors were in, in cities or towns. So Omaha, by the stockyards, they had a, a lot of processing capacity, but you had a, a lot of processing capacity in other, other kinds of cities or larger towns. And um, these were urban workforces. And guess what? They were unionized. And so in the um, 1960s, IBP said, hey, let's put our pl processing plants closer to the supply of animals. So then you start to see this regional specialization in processing animals and raising animals. And that's what you'd have in Iowa, in Kansas. That's why almost all the feedlots are in the, in the Great Plains, excuse me, in the Great Plains. And it also meant that during the 1970s and 1980s, more than a thousand meatpacking plants closed um, across, the, across the country. And uh, companies moved out of these unionized places into more rural areas, and you saw um, deep wage concessions from the unions, and the last one being the Hormel strike that really broke um, the unions um, in the 1980s. In poultry, what's interesting is by the early 1960s, so it's concentrating much more quickly than beef and pork and so on, but the early 1960s, uh, Harold Breimeyer is writing, you only have a cash market left on Delmarva Peninsula on the East Coast, and that was less than 20% of the market. But still, 19, so you have a lot of the integrator relationships that we see today and we blame for the problems, but um, 1978, the CR4 of the top poultry firms was 12%. Today, it's 54%. The problem, Union Parish, Louisiana, there was a 30-year study that my mentor, Bill Heffernan, did between 1969 and 1999. In 1969, there were four integrators. Two of them were local, two of them were national. 1982, only two left. They were both national, and the one bought the other one right away, right after that. By 1999, you got one choice. Persistent Poverty County, Union Parish, Louisiana, 1969. Persistent Poverty Ca uh, County, still in 1999, even though it has one of the highest grossing agricultural sales in, in Louisiana. So you had this consolidation tendencies, and so we really saw this in meat um, in the, you know, moving in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Now this has had structural um, issues on the farm, right? So now the median between, uh, for broilers, and it's actually higher than this now, but in 2012, the median um, size for broilers was 680,000 broilers a year, and it's up over 700,000 now. Milk cows in 2012 were um, 900 cows was the median herd size, and it's over 1,300 now. In 1987, it was 80. So look at the changes in this, right? So what you have now is you have these very large meatpacking companies that rely on so many pigs coming in. You got to bring 200 in at a time. You know, you've got to be big enough to have 200 pigs ready at the same time. And if you're if you can't do that, then you you don't really have um, any place to go. So it's had um, impact. Um, this consolidation on the meatpacking side has had an impact all the way down um, through the uh, uh, farm level and, and vice versa. So we don't have any infrastructure in the middle left at all. And I'm going to end there because I'm 20 seconds over, but I can take questions later.
Yeah, thank you, Mary, for uh, mentioning that because I did neglect to uh, bring that point out at the beginning. I was uh, anxious to hear what you had to say. Um, yes, we have this design to quickly flow from one uh, speaker to the other because, and we're taking questions at the end um, because we suspect that some questions may get answered as we go along. However, this is being recorded and um, therefore the uh, anything that's put into the chat box down below on your screen is also going to show up in the recording so just anything that you put in the chat box is going to be visible um, to all viewers um, and in the recording if you have a question for one of the participants um, put that into the q a box and we're going to uh, try to answer them uh, at the end, unless it's something uh, that pertains to clarity and we'll address it earlier. We expect to have the recording made available um, hopefully by the weekend, um, probably by Monday. So we'll be uh, polishing that up. Um, and I think that should cover the Q&A. So we'll go on to the, um, and oh yes, and we'll have a, a few spots here and there with some polls popping up just gathering some information from the audience. All right, so the next one, we have um, Dr. Liz Boyle coming on. She's a professor at K-State here, and she was the one that taught me my HACCP class. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Liz has been with me since I first entered the meat business at age 17. So um, she's gonna give us a little bit of the small meat clacker um, history there. Are you on, Liz? I'm on, I'm ready, right. thank you. Hi everyone, I'm glad you joined us tonight. And Rosanna is an awesome example of someone who started at a young age and has progressed and matured in the meat industry to become really a, a one of the leaders in the meat industry in Kansas. So I'm excited that she pulled this together. I've been looking through the list of participants and see we've got uh, several meat processors on. So as we go through, they probably can give you even more history than I can in terms of the chain landscape of the meat industry in Kansas because they've lived it. I've watched it from K-State and I've done surveys and talked to people, but these folks have actually lived it. But if we look back, um, the, I don't have PowerPoints, so I'm just going to be talking. Uh, the state of Kansas did a post-legislative audit back in the early 2000s, and one of the things they documented was from 1996 to 2002, there were 63 fewer state-inspected plants in the state of Kansas. So we dropped essentially 42% of our very small and small meat processing businesses. As you heard from Dr. Hendrickson, there's a variety of reasons uh, with consolidation of the large industry, but what was happening with the other end of the industry, the, small, the smaller businesses? Of those 63 plants, 44 of them closed outright, 24 changed their status, they went either to federal, they went to custom, or they changed to become a grocery store, and so they were out of the same kind of inspection status, and during that frame of time, only five new plans opened in Kansas. So the question that comes up then is why? Why did these changes happen? There's a variety of reasons why this happened. And again, the meat processors can address this much better than I could ever touch on it. But for some of the reasons, for some of these process, uh, uh, processors, their business just wasn't profitable enough to sustain their business. And we'll talk about some of the reasons for that. We had, during that time frame, our HACCP regulation. Rosanna just alluded to at 17, she learned how to develop HACCP and apply that to a meat processing industry. We had an older population of processors who were very resistant to have to learn this new food safety management system, develop plans for all of their products, and have another level of regulatory, um, it, uh, regulatory oversight over their particular businesses. And they decided it wasn't worth taking the time to learn 
this program to develop the plan and to have to implement those plans and live with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Another reason that was cited was interaction with inspection personnel. Some processors are fortunate to have very good relationships with their inspection personnel. Other processors, it's a challenge because we're talking about people and people's personalities and personalities don't always um, mesh very well. And we have a lot of different perspectives on how the regulation might be interpreted. And you may have, um, there may have been one inspector saying, giving one message, another inspector giving another message, and it got um, tiresome for some plants to have to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. When you think about the small meat processing industry, a lot of these plants started out as what we call locker plants, meaning that they served as a frozen storage for people who had animals processed, they didn't have freezer capacity back in their homes in the 30s and 40s and 50s, so they relied on the local locker plant to store their meat. Well, given that, when you think about the age of some of our plants, in case by the time we got into the 90s, we had plants with a significant amount of age on, requiring substantial um, capital improvement require or capital improvement needs, and because of the amount of financing it would take to make those capital improvements, some of those businesses just said it wasn't worth investing that amount of money. Another reason that we had changes was due to retirements where people aged out and said, I'm ready to retire, but I don't have a family member that wants to take my business over because I, I didn't have family um, or I don't have people that are interested in succeeding in the business and taking the business over. So we had a lot of different factors that influenced why we saw that big change in our meat industry in Kansas. But not only that, not only the challenges cited in this legislative report by the state of Kansas, there were other factors. One of those is trade workforce. I've talked with many processors who have uh, shared how difficult it could be to obtain or secure people who had the understanding of how to harvest meat, how to fabricate a carcass, how to do processing. And sure, you hire people and train them to do that, but there's also a need to bring people in who already have those skills. And if you look at our education system across the U.S., a lot of our traditional meat processing um, uh, it, places don't offer that any longer to the general public. Now, there are some options that are changing today. There's a group called Central Tech that has some online courses where people can do some online training to learn some of those skills, but it's just not the same as getting in and learning with your hands and actually doing that with your hands. That's a big jump from here we're doing it online to here we're actually putting it in practice. So having a trained workforce has been a challenge all along. And another um, Bureau of Labor Statistics has said that in 2019, the average butcher had a salary of around 35000 or made just a little over $15 an hour. We all know that the meat business is a very labor-intensive business. Well, do I want to go work at McDonald's or somewhere else where I can get about $12 or $13 an hour? Or do I want to really work very hard physically and earn $15 an hour? It's not hard to see that a lot of people may choose to pick an industry where it's not as labor-intensive. We also have historically throughout the years that the meat industry for small and very small businesses can be somewhat cyclic in terms of we've got a large amount of animals coming in during 4-H, during county fair times, during finishing times when cattle are normally being finished. And so the processor would often turn to alternative um, options during non-big times, just deer processing. 
Well, today we have an entire different climate due to the pandemic where we have processors who are booked out till the end of 2021, even into 2022. My concern with that type of out uh, of people booking out so far ahead is how many are actually going to cancel those reservations or those bookings and leave the processors in a lurch where I expected this many animals coming in, they've just backed out on me for whatever reason. So I'm hoping that a lot of the processors took the stance that if you want to make uh, a uh, harvest date a, over a year out, you're going to pay a non-refundable deposit so that if you do back out, I've got some income still that I can rely on. But it's not always been a steady volume. So part of it deals with the relationships between the local community and the processor. And what is that relationship like? Do they have a relationship where the producers are planning to come in and are dedicated to using their local processor? Or have they had some kind of experience that led them to say, you know what, I don't want to use them anymore. I'm going to go 50 miles away and use this other processor. So some of that continuity can always be a challenge in the industry. And then also benefits in terms of finding, uh, people expect benefits. So it's always been a challenge for the very small business of how am I going to provide insurance benefits? How am I going to provide a retirement plan? Things that we now look for and rely on for our security and our older age, can we do that at, an comp at a compensation level that makes the employee feel valued that they want to stay within the business? So but, um, another thing that came up recently, and I was just reading a quote by uh, Chris Young, who's the executive director of AMP, and he said one of the local or one of the current problems with our industry is that we have a lot of uh, plants who have retail counters and if they aren't able to use their own amp, um, product that they process in their plant, so for example if they're custom only they have a retail counter, they're having to buy meat from another source in order to have retail meat supplies. Well given the pandemic, what Chris said was these bigger processors, so like Tyson's, Excel's, are going to sell to who's buying the most. And our small processors are the ones who are going to get left out, especially if they're not willing to pay the prices these folks want. So not only do we have, demo, uh, we have events happening back in the 90s that caused a big shift in our small meat processing industry, we're seeing that big shift now. Yes, we've got a lot of bookings. People are so busy that they're challenged with keeping up. Some companies are even saying, you know, I can't handle retail sales a couple of days because I need to put all of my labor on the kill floor or on the foundation floor to handle the influx and the commitments that I've made. So I think what we saw in the 90s, we're going to be seeing now with a lot of changes with our small meat processing industry. Roseanne, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Thank you, Liz. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, Emma, I think we had a poll here before I got get started talking. Um, did that come up to everybody? Oh, right there. Okay. I can just blab on in the background. We're just interested for those among you that are uh, meat processors. If you just want to click the buttons. We thought that would maybe be interesting. I have this one and a, a second one here um, that should submit after the first one. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm. we got a little bit of the history of meat plants and uh, looks like most of the folks that are on today, if they are currently using a processor, um, Largely, we have 54% that's accessing USDA inspected, but if you add the custom and state inspected together, that's definitely a larger part of the audience. We're not going to get into the details here today, talking about the difference between custom and state inspected. Um, 
you would, can you put up the one Emma, that has, which one they prefer? Thank you. Um, this is sometimes around the nation and there's been some uh, legislation that we may reference later um, <clears throat> that says, you know, if you have access to a plant, would you prefer that it, that it be, you know, a different inspection system? So my job, we heard a little bit of information on about the meat plant history, large and small. Um, it looks like almost, well, a few more people prefer USDA, but it looks like the state inspected part didn't change, which could be actually pretty fascinating to dig into why somebody prefers custom over USDA or state inspected. That usually boils down to a farmer's market, um, where, who they're marketing their animals to. Um, so I'm just going to take you, um, on sharing my story, I'm not expecting to tell you anything real um, ground shaking, but I'm coming into this um, from a unique perspective. And so I think my story, a lot of other people can relate to because I am a farmer, a butcher, and a local foods advocate. <laughs> and that combination for our family, the diversity has actually really worked well for us. Uh, you know, my beef processing was busy when my chicken processing was slow and it gave us year-round work for our employees and enabled us to be able to keep better employees because we could offer them year-round instead of seasonal work. Well, all of that really great business plan, like everybody else's, kind of went out the water and the businesses that previously complemented each other were now actually uh, competing interests this year and that was... <laughs> That was not a great thing. So um, the COVID uh, meat crisis for me started um, when I returned to the States about March 13 um, from a third world country. And you know, I'm always expected to come back home to the familiar and it was so weird for me to come back home to, uh, you know, I left, when I left hardly anybody knew the word about the virus or anything. And it definitely wasn't anything that we thought would hit our shores. And then here I come back and it's like me entering a third world country. I, I went to Walmart just to sightsee and was like, wow, these shelves really are like, I, I felt like I was in another country like a lot of you did. <laughs> um, you know, I wasn't having to worry about uh, standing in line for the meat counter. So some of the crunch in the, in the grocery store I also brushed off. It was just interesting. I just thought it was a little amusing you know, what, what people were standing in line and fighting for. We're not going to um, psychoanalyze why we had a, a big, um, why, why people were <laughs> going for the ground beef. I thought it was amusing, like it said something about Americans and their hamburgers, like it maybe other countries were running out of, I actually, I actually did. I called a friend in Germany and I'm like, hey, we're like running out of hamburger in the US. And I wondered what that said about our culture <laughs> is it so like are the germans running out are they like fighting over their bread and beer and they said yeah they really were <laughs> so anyways that aside um i quickly found out whether i needed hamburger or not from the grocery store it was impacting my life as a butcher um less than a week later our phone at the butcher shop started ringing constantly and by constantly <laughs> it rang that constantly for four weeks and for every one phone call that we could answer, three others went to voicemail. And like, I actually <clears throat> brought in a second secretary just to answer phone calls because suddenly everybody was scheduling beef. I went from being scheduled out about 45 days, which was ideal for my operation, to within two weeks, I was scheduled out six months. Um, within four weeks, I was completely scheduled out 12 12 months and I was refusing to schedule any further than that because I was really sure that most of this was panic related. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna have to staff up for probably about an extra 60 days of, of this stuff. And after a while, they're going to uh, trickle down and um, we'll go back to life as normal. <clears throat> well, as we all know, that didn't happen um, and so then I started having to dig into why. So in our, in our plant, as a farmer's, I, you know, I take my own meat to farmer's market. So of course I was going to market and I was seeing increased demand for my product, especially for the early part of the year. Most farmer's market people don't see that until the weather warms up. 
So we were having early demand for our product. Uh, we didn't get into the online shipping and and sales, I guess I should say, to the to the shipping of meat. That's never been a part of our farm, and we chose not to do that. Uh, but I know a lot of the farmers who did saw an even greater increase than us. But here we were having an early sales. Obviously, then we were needing to replenish our inventory with extra booking dates. So some of the people call in my butcher shop were direct to consumer. Um, red meat and pork processors um, with increased sales. And how the uh, farmers were increasing their sales was interesting because they were getting it, you know, some of their regular customers were stocking up, um, seeing the lines in the grocery store and being like, hey, I don't need to do that, I know a farmer. Um, other times, I think we were getting the direct-to-consumer ones, we were getting maybe some spillover from maybe folks that had never bought meat from farmers at say a farmer's market before. Um, they maybe only went there for vegetables or something, picked up their meat at Whole Foods. They were concerned about maybe going into a physical store and preferred the outdoor markets, or maybe they couldn't find their meat um, from the larger wholesalers in the, in the uh, health food market, so they were going to the farmer's market. So we had that segment of consumers and farmers that was up. So those farmers were trying, even though you, if you had done advanced bookings, your advanced bookings were now, you know, no, I mean, if you were selling twice as much, suddenly you only had half as many beef or pigs or whatever on the books is what you needed. And, and as a farm, I seen that first in the red meat. Um, yeah, if they, if we were out of red meat or pork, then it trickled down to chicken. And uh, later in the year, we started seeing the impact on this in our poultry processing facility. But chicken was definitely the ripple, ripple effect of this. <clears throat> so we had the direct-to-consumer markets that were up. <clears throat> then I started getting calls from my local beef finishers. As was alluded to earlier, there was a uh, few um, beef plants, pork plants, major packers that were shut down. And rel for relatively short amounts of time, really you know, a day, a week, um, most of them quickly, thankfully, found uh, a way to come back online and process. But even, the one thing to take into consideration is that a lot of those big beef packers, the amount of beef that they do in one hour would take my plant six months, eight months to do, depending on the speed of the plant. So just missing one hour of production those animals have to go somewhere. These are plants that run, you know, seven days a week. They don't have downtime. They have a perfectly staggered amount of animals coming in so that they can run all the time. When they have to shut down for unscheduled reasons, those animals don't go away. Um, and you can't just come back and butcher them again because there's already animals behind them, behind them that needs butchered. So they had to go somewhere. Um, or be euthanized. And that's where these farmers, these producers started, um, you know, taking them to the butcher shops themselves and hoping that they could sell them direct to consumers or selling them live to consumers who were also frustrated with the uh, crimp in the grocery stores. <clears throat> What's fascinating to me is that was a market segment that I had been quite public about when, if anybody was asking me for uh, marketing advice with animals, that I thought that the bulk meat segment of, of direct-to-consumer sales was, was dead. Um, <clears throat> that's how most locker plants built their business, selling, as, as um, <clears throat> we heard earlier from Liz, you know, butchering their own calf in the backyard, half cow, half pig, selling locker beef is how most of these plants even into the 60s, 70s, 80s, um, built their business. You'd have, they would buy, every, it was more common for everybody to have deep freezes, buy a half, a cow, um, eat off of it for a year. Shoppers were buying smaller freezers, moving to smaller homes, uh, going to the grocery store three times a week, just buying uh, meat and all the other groceries in quantities as needed. Nobody was really thinking to uh, stock up. That took a drastic shift, obviously, with the, uh, suddenly they realized that being able to buy just as needed didn't always work. Um, so the quarters, halves, whole business came back 
um, from a dead market, I would say. Additionally, those farmers that were stuck without being able to ship their animals here or there, wherever it was, they were also calling their family and friends and being like, I've got these cows on feed. I can't afford to keep them indefinitely. Pigs in the barn, whatever it was from the uh, commercial uh, streams there. And, you know, they, they were also calling all their family and friends and say, that maybe previously just picked up their meat at Walmart. Um, the other segment of consumers that we've seen come out, and those went shopping directly to the uh, butcher shops usually, if they had retail meat counters or even if they didn't, was the folks that maybe their entire life had only bought their hamburger from Walmart. And now they couldn't get it and they're like, where in the world do we actually find meat now? And then they were exposed to the local butcher shop. So that's part of the reason why we were getting all of these people calling in at once and, and suddenly and without notice. The trouble, the trouble that that created on the butcher shops is, as we heard earlier, we'd known for years that we didn't have enough butcher shops. Uh, that, that was a, you know, acknowledged problem nationwide. Um, you know, I knew it as a butcher, but I, and I think a lot of other farmers can attest to this, it, it totally changed um, how, how we behaved almost in public and it definitely was a, you know, you used to be able to say, oh, you're a farmer or definitely, I, I like to use butchers as a way to quickly end a conversation. I tell my butcher and they go on to other interesting topics. Um, but now it almost felt like if you went and said, hey, I'm a butcher or like, they'd be like, oh, can I like get your autograph or something? <laughs> we actually had people, you know, flag us down on the, on the interstate and ask us to pull over so they could buy meat when we were out there. But um, hit the cumulative effect, so here I was looking at first, I thought for a 60 day crunch, and okay, I can try to go find some uh, ha more hamburger boners, maybe we can go through this faster. The trick being, as we um, started to scale up my beginner wage, um, category, it became apparent this was an ongoing issue. And that's where, when, when I got these phone calls coming into the butcher shop, farmers either um, breaking down and crying on the phone because they couldn't get a beef in for a year and a half, or cussing out my secretary. Both of them actually happened frequently, and it was very taxing mentally to feel like you were the only roadblock between a farmer and his profits, a person in their food, and we had to explain to them <clears throat> beyond that there's some things that money can't buy. Um, I can't just go out and hire new employees. First of all, that's hard to do. Um, secondly, the one thing that money can't buy, as alluded to earlier, is a head meat cutter. I can't go to Tyson's and get an out of work meat cutter because they just do the same thing day after day after day. They don't break down a whole hanging carcass. I can't go to the grocery store and get a meat cutter that will translate an experienced meat cutter at the, at the grocery store does not translate into an experienced meat cutter in my uh, whole animal butchery. Once again, they're only dealing with chunks of meat, not entire hanging carcasses. So that was one point of education that I really had to go over and over and over with my, whether it was consumers or farmers and say, the one thing that I cannot find anywhere for any amount of money is, is an experienced meat cutter. No matter what I do here, I can expand, I can hire more, but nothing goes forward without that experienced meat cutter. So um, that trickled down into then my uh, chicken plant. Everybody, if they couldn't get the beef in, they were raising chicken and offering that as a substitute. Um, that in a response as, as, a, um, as a processor with all that pressure, you know, I was pushing my employees, I was pushing my freezers, my cold storage, and then all of that does also start to domino. My cold storage units had, you know, double, quadruple the meat that they'd ever had in them before, so of course they were breaking down, which was also a stressful situation. I, this year, I've spent over $25,000 in repairs for refrigeration, and as you know, that's mostly the way to a new one. So that, and here we are coming into the end of the year, we're still getting calls from farmers um, 
either <laughs> accusing us that we should have called them when we were booking up so they could book their beef or um, you know, saying, I, I, you know, how can you tell me that you are actually booked out a year and a half? And, and, and that's still a daily thing for us as a processor, uh, beef, pork, any red meat to be able to explain to the farmers. And as the farmer myself, that's a really difficult spot to do is tell the farmer, I'm sorry, I don't have anybody else to recommend you to that's got openings before me. I have no, I have no recommendations for what to do with your animals that are sitting in the field. Um, I'm going to go on to the other um, producers that are on the panel tonight so that they can tell their story. They're coming at it um, from some also some unique angles. But I think we're up next with you, Mark. Um, Mark is my neighbor um, at the Butcher Block. He actually worked at the Butcher Block as a youngster, and we do a lot of processing for him as a commercial beef producer. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to try and share my screen here. Uh, everybody see that all right? I can see it, Mark. You're good. Uh, anyways, my name is Mark Ray. I uh, live at Ottawa Family Farm. Uh, we've Feed cattle, finish cattle, uh, cow, calf, stalker, um, pretty much conception to consumption on a lot of them. Uh, but we do operate uh, with feed yards in Kansas and uh, Colorado. And I guess a lot of this, these have been answered already. You know, as COVID came, what did it do? It closed things at one point, you know, 10% of the cattle. Uh, processing capacity in the U.S. was closed and uh, you know we kill about 110,000 head a day that's kind of an average so you take one day off uh, you know 10 percent that's 11,000 head that day you know a month that's 330,000 head it's quite a bit of backlog and uh, that's what happened was the backlog and and the you know, the corporate feed yards, and I guess before I say corporate feed yards, there's custom feed yards, which is what uh, myself and people like me use. And uh, we do, we do a, uh, quite a bit with, with, uh, with them. And then there's corporate feed yards, the corporate feed yards being like uh, your great uh, green plains, uh, cactus, these are 100,000 head yards, own a quarter million head capacity, very large. Most of the time have a sweetheart deal with one of the four large packers at the first uh, presentation alluded to. You know, they stayed current and the small guys kind of got forgot about. Uh, most of your farmer feeders that are selling the cash, the spot market, uh, they really suffered. And, and it was not uncommon to get uh, have cattle that were 30 days over finished and that that really uh, made producers like myself well what are we going to do we got to have a way out of this we've got to figure something out and so uh, you know the meat case is emptied and and uh, we were just happy to move any cattle anywhere of any kind shape or size as long as they left that was great and you know the issues from the backlog were, you know, that our carcass weights increased immensely. We we had uh, uh, they would every week, every day, the USDA reported carcass weights continued to increase, which made more available red meat on the market, uh, thus driving prices down. And when you feed cattle that long, the death loss. Uh, due to bloat and lameness and, and other things, uh, you could add a one to two percent of those cattle would die in the last 30 days of that overfed period. Well, in a hundred head, you'd lose one to two, two animals at a couple thousand dollars a piece. That really starts to trickle down into the bottom line, along with the death loss comes decreased conversions. An animal would not be gaining as much weight. Uh, 
basically you're feeding them and then not growing. And once again, it costs you every day to, to own them. And if they're not growing, it, it's not economically viable. All these things together kind of made lower prices. And, you know, there's only so many hooks in this country in these, in just little packing plants all the way through the big ones. It, it, and it's, there literally is, every animal has to have a hook. You can't just slaughter an animal and figure it out. If there's not a hook to hang it on, you cannot do anything with it. And Rosanna, she's very mindful of, of knowing how many hooks she has, how, how she can manage that, and, and does a really good job at that. And we got to, we got to a point where, you know, they lowered, they lowered the uh, amount of workforce allowed in the plants, you know, social distancing inside of the plants. So they had to slow down the chain speed. So instead of killing 7,000 a head a day at a plant in Holcomb, Kansas, they were only killing 3,500. Well, that, that really starts to slow down the inflow of cattle and we start to back up. Well, when they know they only have to buy 3,500 that day, they don't really go out and work as hard as if they got to buy 7,000. And uh, it's, it's a dog eat dog world in the cattle feeding business. And uh, these packers, like the first uh, presentation was, it, it may not be collusion. Uh, DOJ evidently didn't find anything on that. Uh, I would venture to guess they didn't look hard enough, but they're, they don't have to collude to know that they're in the driver's seat because there's only so many big players that can play in that that space. And so that uh, that just was a blood in the water and, and prices plummeted and it was uh, it was one of those time periods that everybody would like to forget. Um, but anyway, so b back to normal, I, I don't know if we are. Uh, the show list and a show list is basically a feed yards uh, list of cattle for sale. The feed yard a buyer will show up and say, I'd like your show list. You're basically saying these are the cattle that are for sale. They're finished. I think they're market ready. They're for sale. These show lists are getting smaller. So that would tell me they are likely less cattle that are fat ready for harvest at the moment. Um, which is a good thing, you know, like last week the, the, they only bought 44,000 head. The, any, any head, any yard over 1, 000, or 5,000 head has to report to uh, the USDA. And so they, they only bought 44,000 head. That's half of what they've been buying in the last three weeks to a month. So uh, being probably what I'm hoping is there's a lot of producers that are current that are just going to say, you know, I, I have some to sell and maybe I'm just not ready to sell them yet. And hopefully we get to get to a, a spot where we're a little bit more, have the upper hand and we can tell these packers, no, we don't have anything for you, but uh, time will tell there. Carcass weights are starting to slow down year over year levels. You know, uh, we're still 20 pounds heavier than we were a year ago. So that would tell me there's still some big cattle around, especially in the Northern Plains, but sounds like they've worked through those. And uh, my, ourselves included, we, we really don't have a, as many big cattle uh, in the yards as, as we had. Uh, we've, we've worked through them and uh, most, all the yards we feed in and, and deal with, they are, uh, they all say they're, they're fairly current. Not that there's not any big cattle around to have, but they do have, do have some to sell, but just not as many as they'd like. And with higher price corn and the basis being really high, I don't think anybody in Kansas or Texas or Oklahoma is gonna overfeed one. So I don't think you're gonna see the giant cattle we had to work through all spring and summer. Uh, placements, they're, they're enormous. The last cattle on feed report was was uh, was the record. So there are a record number of cattle in feed yards at the moment. 
that's kind of scary with uh, politics and, and everything that's going on. It, if these plants were to shut down again in the spring uh, with a record number of cattle to come out in the spring to be harvested, this could really put a burden on the major packers. Uh, that's already a burden, but then you then you have to it it just it will trickle down into the small locker plants, the local plants, and and they just don't have the infrastructure to take the burden from those big plants. You know, if they like I said, they kill a hundred thousand head a day. I would I don't know the number. Be interested to see what the national locker plant how many we could kill a day with all those combined. I would guess considerably less than that. But, you know, that's, that's kind of the, the, the back to normal part. And, and uh, consumers are, are, in my mind, uh, consumers are, are not, uh, some of them are not comfortable with going back to the stores. And uh, that's kind of my, I've, in our travels and, and the people we know, uh, they kind of are a little, they've, like my wife, I don't know if she's gone to Walmart or anything in the last six months. I think she picks up, does the deliveries or, or uh, shops online and they deliver it to the parking lot type of things. And, and I think that gives us a chance to, uh, maybe hit this farm to table aspect of the marketing and I'm all for it. Uh, I think uh, the interest in that is excellent because the amount of cattle we feed, there's no way that we could move all of them through the uh, local locker plants, but there are, uh, it might open a door for, my neighbor has 20 cows say, and he is a really good at social media and marketing and, and can just sell these quarters and halves and, and retail cuts that Rosanna, they do an excellent job with packaging and, and the marketing side that just presentable and, and people love the product. I'm probably not gonna be able to do that viability for the size of our operation, but you know, I might be able to, keep a pin for my neighbor and I might be able to feed his cattle. He doesn't have experience in feeding cattle and we do. Uh, and that might work well with other beef producers out there that, uh, you know, my expert, our expertise is, is finishing fat cattle and, and uh, I'm not, my expertise is not social media and marketing at all. Hence my really fancy uh, PowerPoint, but, uh, but it might be a place where we can work together because in the end, I, I want all consumers to, to have an enjoyable eating experience every single time that they, they eat beef. I, it doesn't matter where they get it, be it from Walmart, Whole Foods, uh, or their neighbor or a local, pro, a local farmer uh, buying, the, buying the meat through a, a shop like Rosanna's. But it the we still have to remember the consumer confidence in the product they're getting and they've got to enjoy it every single time and uh that's my uh that'd be my only my only scare is uh sometimes product consistency is something that we'll have to overcome uh i know i deliver a lot of cattle to rosanna's facility and uh and and there, there's there's definitely a, a lot of different uh, quality for sure, and, and uh, I I just want people to be uh, somehow be a little bit more educated in what we're buying and and getting the right product. That way, we do every time they do buy a, a they do choose beef to put on their plate that they enjoy it and use it again and do it again. And I'm sure that was kind of a fast over deal, but uh, 
Thank you, Mark. I know I gave you kind of a big topic with yeah. not well, much time, and that uh, I like how your um, con your hat kind of reinforced your concluding statement. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thank you for, for addressing that. Um, now, I thought it would be interesting to hear a little bit um, from a heritage um, animal producer and direct marketer. So we're going to hear from Jonathan with Oddbird Farm. Um, he's also in the Kansas area. And I just thought it'd be really fascinating to hear how his experience has been this year. Jonathan. Hi, thanks for having me. So um, I am a, a new farmer raising heritage pork. Um, I'm also new to farming in general. I didn't grow up on a farm. Um, I grew up in the suburbs. My my dad grew up on a farm and I spent a lot of time on the, the family farm as a kid. Um, and I was fortunate to study sustainable agriculture at Johnson County Community College under Stu Schaefer, um, who aside from being a farmer is a, a sociologist. And so that really put into uh, context, what I, I saw on my grandpa's farm as a, a commercial hog farm in the 90s and, and 2000s, um, which was like this need to constantly scale up, doing, uh, you know, large production on, on slim margins, high input costs, all of that. And then eventually at some point, grain costs went up, hog prices went down, and, and a lot of people had to get out. And so starting the farm, I, I wanted to do as much the inverse of that as I, I possibly could. Um, low initial investment, low input costs. Um, vertical integration, so you're not getting squeezed by the, the packers on one side and the feed and pharmaceutical companies on the other side. And that's what led me to heritage breeds. Um, I raised Michon pigs, which is a, a very rare old heritage breed originally from China. Um, so they're incredibly hardy, they're incredibly self-sufficient. Um, we average in the ballpark of 85% wean to fair ratio with our sows uh, without confining them, without crush bars, without crates. Uh, we've never had to medicate an animal and we've never had a, a sick animal or ins any incidental mortality. Uh, the setback is they take about twice as long or more to get up to weight. We're typically butchering at about 12 to 14 months. Um, but at the same time, they also have a bit different digestive system where they can handle a lot more fiber in their diet and they can deal with uh, a lot cheaper feeds. Um, and so this uh, was really helpful for us this year for, for having such a tough year. Um, when COVID hit, we had about 50 pigs to take to market. Uh, we had originally been selling all to restaurants, 100% uh, of our sales. And we had a distributor out of New York who was looking to buy a couple pigs from us and then go under contract with us. Uh, we had applied to be at the farmer's market in Overland Park, but they were only going to give us about 10 dates. And so when restaurants closed down, the distributor backed out and 100% of our restaurant sales were just gone. And so we had to figure out what to do with, with all of our meat. Fortunately, we did already have the butcher dates. Uh, and that's one way in which the, the slow growth became an advantage because we we could you know schedule our dates well in advance because you know, they're already on the ground 12 to 14 months before they're, they're going to the butcher. Um, and so we, we just kind of had to re regroup and figure out how to sell the pork. Um, and at first we, we hit social media, we were doing uh, weekly deliveries into Kansas City. Uh, and then, well, the, one of the major producers at the farmer's market backed out and they invited us to, to just pick up a lot more dates. Uh, and that's that's a lot of what, what really saved us. Um, but it wasn't completely home free at that point. There was still a big learning curve. There was a few things that happened. Um, namely, one of the big differences is that your processing is a lot different. Uh, the restaurants we were selling to, they really like to do everything in-house, whether they're curing or smoking or grinding or whatever. And so they buy essentially whole primals. Whereas when you're selling at a farmer's market, people want one pound packages of bacon, ground sausage, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, and we also had to figure out, you know, what kinds of things to produce because you can produce a, a pretty wide variety of things. And so we had to figure out where we had better margins, what was more popular, and then also how to move through pigs at a consistent rate because you'll sell tons of bacon, tons of chops. Our shoulders have actually been very popular, but then we were left figuring out how to sell our hams. Uh, we realized that, you know, we can 
do like ground pork, ground sausage, bratwurst, four or five different products out of the ham. And so that way, even though we're selling five, five times as much bacon as, as pork chops, we're still moving through the inventory much, much more evenly. Um, the other thing was that we, we still had inventory left from when we were selling to restaurants. So we had like these 15 pound uh, hog legs, hindquarters, and you know, it's not something people want to buy at a farmer's market. And we were fortunate to meet one of our fellow vendors who has their own um, artisan sausage shop. And so we kind of worked out a deal with him where he broke them down, made sausage out of it. He kept a, a portion for himself. And then we were, you know, actually had a marketable product to sell with the rest of it that was at a, a much higher margin than we would get for just a whole hind quarter. Um, but the other thing that was an issue there was the labor requirements. I mean, we had an outlet for the pork, but that's two days a week where we're working, you know, eight hour plus days when you load up, drive out, work the market, drive back and unload. Um, so that was a, a, a huge labor requirement that we, we had to meet. Um, so there were some disadvantages there and we did run into to issues with some of our, our butcher dates. So we had dates scheduled through spring and, and summer, but uh, when we were looking to get dates in October, this, the quickest we could do was, was January and December. Um, but again, with having pigs that can, can handle lower quality feed, we just started putting them on cheaper diets earlier. And so, you know, if we were to take them in at uh, 12 months, they, they would be a little bit small, but um, at 15, 16 months, they'll be where they should be at 12 months and our feed costs won't be much more. It's going to be more labor. There's, you know, more holding capacity water. There's some differences, but, you know, those things are a lot easier to absorb than just 20% higher feed costs. Um, and as well, um, there was also the issue of, well, as Rosanna and people talked about, the, the butcher dates were all backed up. And that's because of this flood of, of commercial pork into the, the smaller butchers. And a lot of small, you know, farm to table distributors or farmers, I mean, ran into the issue of, of just having the marketplace flooded with this cheap pork. And that's a, another advantage of, of us having the, the heritage breed is, is that we, you know, we produce a pork that's very different. It's, it's a very different product. Uh, when I started the farm, I was looking into some of the, the market research through like Iowa State and universities, and, and they, they identify what I do as, as niche pork production. And what's interesting about it is that there's uh, different reasons and different demands from the consumers. Some people just want to buy pork that's local. Some people want heritage breeds either for the sake of, um, you know, protecting genetic diversity or because they think it's a higher quality. Some people want higher quality pork. Some people want pork that's not medicated or not fed, um, you know, GMO feeds or, or more organically fed in those things. And they don't all overlap. And one of the things we chose to do early on was to be able to check all those boxes. We have a heritage breed. We're feeding predominantly organic, all non-GMO. Um, we're not really, we're not using any hormones, antibiotics, or any of that in, in raising our animals. And so um, this, this flood of pork was really only a portion of the niche market. And we were, we were still able to kind of have a good foothold on, uh, you know, essentially a lot of our customers are not going to buy that, even though it's cheap and available. They, they still want our pork. Um, the other advantage of, of the Michon pork is, is that it's a, a much higher quality than commercial pork. Um, commercial pigs are bred to grow really big, really quick, and as a result, the, the tissue type they develop is, uh, you know, it's lighter in color, it's tougher, it's less flavorful, it doesn't retain moisture as well, it dries out really easily. And in the Michon, the, the fiber type they develop, especially growing slow, is, is at the other end of the spectrum. It's, it's very red, very moist, very steaky, very well marbled. And so, you know, a lot of our customers tell us like they hate going to the grocery store to buy pork now because they've, they've kind of been spoiled. Um, so that, that really helped insulate us um, from that. So, I mean, overall it was, it was definitely like a strange year. It was, it was certainly much harder than what we were predicting, but you know, we still sold three times as much pork as we did the year prior. We're still continuing to grow and we were able to roll with it and, and adapt. So. Thank you, John. And I'll agree, if anybody has not um, seen a Michon pig before, they really should because they, I laugh every time John brings them in because they remind me of bulldogs. <laughs> um, next and that's very marketable on social media too. What's that? Yeah, I think- It's very uh, marketable on social media. You'll probably be able to see those on his website. Um, 
Next up, I didn't want to just uh, hear Kansas farmers' stories, so I have Michelle coming in from Colorado with some beef and the her online sales and shipping. So, Michelle. Hi. Good, good evening. Oh, can you hear me? We can hear you. You're coming okay. through good. Okay, cool. Cool. Um, did you want me just to go ahead and start? Go ahead, yes. All right, well, we started the year, we've been doing um, online direct from um, our farm to consumer sales for well over 15 years now. Primarily, we've been selling at farmer's markets. Um, that's been 90, 95% of our sales. Um, we've tried numerous times to go online and to um, sell online and then ship. Um, we've tried two twice in the past 10 years and it's never worked out. Shipping is a very difficult thing as I'm sure a lot of you guys have figured out. Um, shipping it just is when you're dealing with a frozen heavy product, it's not cheap. It's hard to get um, when you're doing multiple uh, containers to get the right labels on the right, right um, uh, boxes. It, there's just a lot of things that go on there. So what we ended up doing, um, and actually it was just, it's a total God thing. Well, um, about a few weeks before COVID lockdown, we happened to try our third time at going online. And we used a, a company called Barn to Door, very reasonably priced. And we thought, you know, I've got all these issues. I've been talking to them for months. I've got issues that, you know, we have stock, we run out of stock. Then we get stock back in. We only, um, want to be able to do deliveries within our certain zip codes and different things like that. Well, they had a lot of this stuff already all worked out. So we went online about a week or two, probably before lockdown. And um, with our product, we signed up on a, a Thursday, we had our onboarding on a Friday. And by Tuesday, the following Tuesday, we were up and taking orders. Um, now we were mostly just emailing out to our current client list because um, we always are getting emails at the farmer's markets. We're constantly getting, um, when we meet new people and they want to keep in touch and find out how to get our product, we have an email list where you just handwrite it. We're just old school, just handwrite it on a piece of paper and hope we can read it later when we go to key it in. Um, so that's basically how we have gotten our emails um, over the years. And so when that happened, we started going online, um, our orders just kind of went through the roof. We almost sold out of all of what we were going to be selling at the farmer's market this year online. Our, our main mode of distribution is um, we have one day a week that we do deliveries um, and we go to Denver. We're, we're located right between Denver and Colorado Springs, but most of our farmers, most of our customers are up in Denver. So one day a week we do deliveries and we do charge a delivery fee. And then one day a week we do grab and goes where we're basically at, um, um, well, what we do is we just stay at Home Depot parking lots around the city. We're only there for one hour on a Saturday and they know to look for us and they're a red truck and they come and pick up and then that's for free if they place their lot. So they've already purchased the product. We know what we're bringing. We've already collected the money and they're just coming there to pick up. Um, and so that seems to have been working amazingly well. Um, we did quit doing our grab and goes during farmer's markets um, because we were just too busy during farmer's markets. We're starting that up again next week. And we already have a very full schedule for grab and goes again. Um, so I would highly recommend um, that because shipping is expensive, uh, especially if you're not part of a big co-op and you're not getting those discounted rates. Um, it just, it can, be way, way pricier than the actual product you're sending. Um, so anyway, so that's primarily what has our story kind of in a nutshell. Um, we do a lot of emails. Um, we try, we're trying to cut back on our emails that we send to our customers, but keeping in touch with our, with your customers, they want to know what's going on at the, at the farm. They want to know what, what, what's available. They want to know the stories. They want to know that person, who is it that they're buying from and that you're not just a big corporation. And so we use our emails a lot to, to get that out there and about how, why we're different and why our beef is different. Um, we have found that because of it, a lot of people have referred other people, um, their friends, their neighbors, their family to purchase. Um, so that, that has been huge for us as well. Um, and still out here, I know somebody mentioned earlier, our Walmarts and everything out here are very scarce, very sparse with their beef department, especially with their beef department is very sparse. So, um, Anyway, so that is kind of what, where, what has 
how our business has changed or how our distribution has changed. Um, I know we have spent quite a bit of money to in the past six months um, marketing online. So you know, everybody hears, oh, you need to market online, you need to do social media, you need to, I think all that stuff is absolutely fantastic and great. And we have gotten a handful of customers from that, but primarily it's the face-to-face -face getting their, their emails at the farmer's markets, or we do other events. We're a, we do a couple of wine shows where we're the beef sponsor for a couple of wine shows, um, some different foodie events and things like that that we get. Um, we're just, we're really getting the niche of the foodie people in Denver and Colorado Springs. That's kind of who our clientele is. Um, but we're there, we're not necessarily always selling, we're always getting um, contact into growing our email list. And so that's really, that's our bread and butter is our email list and um, staying true to that group. So anyhow, did I cover everything, Roseanne? Is that what you would uh, want to hear? Great, Michelle, that was just a, a really quick tour, which is what we were looking for. Um, we have a poll now, kind of a, in a good transition here. Um, if you have that, Emma, ne our next speaker up is um, Kelly with the uh, National Sustainable Ag Coalition. And <clears throat> she'll be talking about processing access across the nation so if you had if you are a processor um you can answer the one that popped up there um and we have our results here for kelly to see before it goes on onto her so yeah in other words <laughs> the lack of processing has not surprisingly hindered business growth um kelly can you talk about that Kelly is a Kansas girl now in DC with NSAC. She has a national uh, view for us. Thank you, Rosanna. And I'm really excited to be here as a Kansan. Uh, I have uh, been working at the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition for a few years now. And we focused on small plant issues for a few decades at the federal level. Um, in particular because of the access needs that we've heard from smaller scale sustainable farmers and ranchers and the needs we've heard from small processors across the country. Uh, and, and one thing and one theme I've heard uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic from small processors across the country is how long will the demand last? Uh, on this map here you can see counties in blue where there is not a cattle slaughter facility at the small scale and there are some uh, small cattle operations. And while this data is about eight years old, uh, we predicted that it was pretty similar up until uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, with the shifts and with certain operations, maybe larger scale operations also using small slaughter facilities, uh, the demand in some of these counties might have increased, but I show this map in part to uh, talk about how there may not always be the lack of access that uh, some farmers and ranchers are talking about, especially before the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in certain areas of the country. And so that's something we've been talking to small processors a lot about. Obviously right now there's a huge bottleneck uh, in, in a lot of areas and what happens if new facilities pop up? Um, what does that mean for the existing small processors? Uh, will we see some of the trends in the future like Dr. Boyle mentioned? And this is something that we're really considering um, as we craft legislation to help support small processors right now. Um, I think that everyone's asked at least Congress and, and certainly us for a magical solution. And unfortunately, uh, there isn't one. Um, I think that what some of the other speakers talked to is really important to bring up again uh, with just the different volumes that we've seen at larger scale plants versus smaller scale plants. Um, I, I think someone asked like, what does a, a small scale facility slaughter in a day? And we typically, um, work with plants that slaughter 10 to 100 animals a day versus the large plants that are slaughtering 10,000 to 20,000 a day. So small plants are not going to be able to replace the demand right now. Um, they're at max capacity, as you've heard, and, and right now they need support more than ever. And so uh, that's something we've really been focused on. Um, we, we've constantly been hearing about 
the thin margins that small plants already operate on and and we really want to be able to support small plants during the pandemic um, and where appropriate throughout the country help support new facilities um, and so with that there's also kind of a difference when it comes to certain species um, you can see here with um, access to chicken slaughter that's very different compared to access to cattle slaughter there might be a need for um, even more smaller scale poultry facilities across the country. Um, but it's still important to recognize that not every area and every county could financially support a new small plant if the demand that we see right now does not continue. And so that's something we've talked a lot about. Um, there's been a huge increase in questions that uh, we've received that other organizations like the Niche Meat Processors Assistance Network have received around creating new facilities. And we've talked about a lot of the hurdles and barriers that, um, that exist for anyone who wants to create a new smaller scale plant. Uh, there's of course the financial costs, um, the estimates that um, we've had have been around a million dollars to get started. And then as you heard from Rosanna um, and others, finding um, qualified employees is the other huge barrier that we hear. And so that's something we've really tried to, um, tried to think through how can we create more longer term solutions in the future to address some of these problems. Um, and then we've also heard about the time it takes to achieve, achieve federal inspection. In particular, there's been an increased interest in federal inspection. Um, but before the COVID-19 pandemic, there were some small, um, newer uh, poultry facilities that we were trying to work with, and it was still taking them about 10 to 12 months to, to achieve federal inspection. And so um, that's something, again, where unfortunately, uh, even with new facilities, they might not be available right away uh, to have federal inspection. Um, there are some custom plants that are looking at federal inspection right now that our members have been working with. Uh, some of them have taken uh, about seven months to achieve federal inspection. And so in some instances, um, an already existing custom plant might have a little more opportunity, but it's still uh, quite a bit of financial resources that are going into um, creating and expanding new facilities. When it comes to existing small scale processors, that's been uh, kind of our biggest focus right now. Um, the opportunities to expand at, uh, at an increased volume, uh, we believe will be faster um, and possibly more available with already existing small plants. Uh, and with those, there have been a number of hurdles. Um, it, again, like no magical solution here, but um, we are kind of looking at what those hurdles are, uh, including just the fact that there has been increased costs to small plants across the country um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I've heard anywhere from $20,000 to um, an upwards of $80,000 that some of the small plants we work with have been spending on COVID-19 related costs already. And, and they're really hurting with really thin margins. Um, and so that's something we've talked about and, and how we can't afford to lose more small plants right now, um, especially with the increased consolidation we've seen and the lack of access in certain areas. We really want to be able to provide financial support, um, health care, mental health support uh, for the small plant operators out there um, at this time. If, if we lose more plants, I think we'll see an even bigger issue with the bottleneck. And so we really need to think about how to support the small plants that already exist. Um, and then we've also talked to a lot of small processors that are interested in expanding right now, but are really worried about taking out a loan maybe um, and what that might mean if the demand no longer exists in the future. So there are a few things that we've been looking at at the federal level. Um, the first one being the Strengthening Local Processing Act, which includes three bigger picture options. I don't have time to go into detail, um, but overall we're looking at some more scale appropriate options um, related to those HACCP plans that Dr. Boyle mentioned. Uh, and then we're also looking at infrastructure support, some grants to help expand already existing facilities, new facilities. Uh, and then the third part is really focused on grants that would provide universities, community colleges, small processors, other organizations 
with uh, some grant funding to really build on education and training to support the next generation of meat processors and butchers. So really trying to look at that skilled labor issue and how we might be able to address it. Um, so I, I really encourage everyone, if you could ask your member of Congress to sponsor this bill. Um, it's something we definitely would like to see in the future, trying to think through longer term solutions. How can we make sure that um, there's access in the future and that if a disaster occurs, we have some infrastructure and support there to address it. Uh, there's also a few other bills that I'll quickly mention. Um, the Food Supply Protection Act in the Senate is one we've been looking at pretty closely. It has additional infrastructure grants um, and also COVID-19 related. And then there's also the small packer, even um, just some studies so we can really see where is there a need for more access to slaughter in what areas of the country right now. There's also um, a number of state departments of agriculture that have used uh, the last COVID-19 relief bill from Congress, the CARES Act, um, some of the funding they received to create small grant programs for small plants. Uh, the Kansas Department of Agriculture actually did this, um, and I think the deadline's already passed, but uh, I would expect that if you, if you don't see a grant program occur in the next COVID-19 relief package, there might be additional funding for states at least. And so I encourage you all to, to talk to the Department of Ag if there's still a need for that. Uh, they might be able to use some of that funding to provide additional grants for small plants. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we have, before we go on to our last speaker, um, we have one poll related to what Kelly was talking about. If, the la if you are a, a processor, if the lack of processing has hindered your, um, I'm sorry, how long you're waiting for the new slaughter dates. I got that on the wrong one. Um, and we'll move on to Sue here. <laughs> if we uh, submit those but so up to now we've kind of mostly just been doing storytelling from the different farmers and um so now we kind of move into the part of if you've stuck with us this long we move into the part of the section where sue is going to tell us where to find the answers and i think you might be surprised at where they're hiding do we have results from that uh survey yet emma oh right there all right. Um, what about the one about how long we're waiting for the processing? Maybe it's not available yet. We might see that after you talk, Susan. Go ahead. Um, oh, wait, here it comes. All right. Uh, a surprise. I'm impressed that we have 33% saying no. So that's actually, I would say, a really interesting piece of information, Kelly. All right, we're going to move on now to uh, Susan Beal. She's the APA board president and she's coming in from Ontario. Is that right? I can't remember where you're at in Canada. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in southern Ontario now. Um, after I, uh, uh, I lived in west central Pennsylvania for about uh, the better part of 30 years and, and back up in Canada now. And have uh, really similar issues here um, as as my uh, friends and colleagues have been seeing stateside. I think we're living in really creative times, and this past year has really been a testament to the inventiveness and resilience and adaptability of humans. Um, and it's also been a real clear reminder to the frailty and dysfunction and vulnerability of the of the um, food production and distribution system um, in part because the system is dominated by the large corporate consolidated entities and i think the thing that that's been really interesting to me is all of a sudden all of us who've been saying you know it's all connected and we know it's all connected and the knee bone is is connected to the ankle bone. People are really, really realizing that in different ways. We're really realizing it in different ways as farmers and, and producers. We're realizing it as processors and egg supply companies. Uh, we, we um, you know, even crazy things like people who are trying to move into shipping meat. Uh, 
we can't get boxes because the boxes come from different places or we can't get containers or we can't get plastic wrap or we trying to decide are we going to breed our pigs now or i had a conversation with a friend of mine uh when i was in minnesota in late uh, february the beginning of march you know if you were a sow breeder would you be breeding your sows now or what would you be doing so we've got those kind of interconnections that we're seeing within the ag community we've got a realization and a recognition that just as the meat industry is really consolidated and um uh held in the hands of very few uh we're realizing that the grain industry is held in the hands of very few as well i was listening last night to uh joe maxwell delivering in the opening keynote for the regenerate 2020 conference and he reminded us that four companies control uh 80 percent of the beans uh in 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 the country um uh, four companies control 73% of the cattle in the country, 84 companies control 83% of the cereal, and if we're counting, four companies control 75 or 78% of the beer production. And, and we also know how the livestock is all interdigitated into that sort of stuff. The other thing that we're seeing is people, um, you know, the, the happy homeowners and the consumers and stuff are also looking at things in a new way. You know, the pictures came out really, really soon. Uh, I have photographs from uh, into, you know, the first, into the part of March where the, the shelves were bare. Uh, people were worrying about where they were going to get food. Uh, there's, this is, this is an interesting, Waterloo County, Ontario is very much like the Lancaster County of Pennsylvania, except they farm like flatlanders out here. They farm like it's the Midwest. Um, but it's a, a really strong Mennonite community and, and uh, a lot of Dutch immigrant now, uh, recent Dutch, relatively recent, you know, 20, 30 years. And, and what we were finding is everybody's got eggs for sale, except you can't get any because everybody's come from town uh, to come out to, the, to get them because you can't find them in the stores because of production backlogs and interesting things. And so people are, are having a real sense of, their vulnerability in the source and their ability to source feed and and food for themselves and and what happens next the other thing that's that people are finding is there's just like really crazy co connections you know just like the packing kinds of things uh the odd things that happened in poultry grit uh because of a, a breakdown in equipment and a fire that happened uh we're finding that uh for example the poultry people you know, it's pretty easy and quick to scale up in poultry a whole lot faster than if you're trying to get more cattle or hogs on the market because your generation and grow time is so much shorter. And, and a lot of people were finding that the, in the same way that folks were buying uh, hogs from the, the, the hogs that got caught up in not being able to make it into slaughter, we found a lot of people were starting to take their own, um, you know, getting control of their food in a different way than a lot of people ever had you know they're used to getting it go to the store to the captured food store it's always there the shelves are always full there's too much choice suddenly there's no choice a lot of the places are locked down uh people people were traveling far less in canada than they were in any of the regions that i know in the states um and so now people decided that they're going to keep backyard chickens they're going to keep try and grow some stuff for meat they're going to plant their you know the equivalent of the victory garden that we saw so everybody's planting in their gardens um my csa guy his csa went from 40 people to 100 people uh this season in his in his actually second full year of csa stuff and had he not ordered seeds when he did in january because he was kind of bored and getting ready to plant he wouldn't have been able to source seeds and goofy things like we can't get canning jars, you know, because everybody's decided that they need to can. So we're finding some really interesting things about the mycelial way that we're all connected when we look out. And I think people have done an incredible job of, of um, kind of doing what it is that everybody needed to do to make it work for them. You know, most of the people in this call and most of the people in the audience uh, just scanning the list, we tend to drive speedboats 
uh, when can, you know, compared to the larger sort of Titanic boats that the, the really huge uh, producer guys make. So we can be a little bit more agile and make some changes. And people did what they needed to do to make it work for them. And a lot of it was reactionary. Uh, we had, you know, the stories were heard tonight. You know, our wholesale accounts went away and now we had to do something else. Uh, we uh, had to think about new accesses to market. We had to think about, geez, maybe I want to do more poultry than I need to do other species because it moved faster. We had to look maybe at different ways to, um, to access uh, to access slaughter. So for example, again, poultry has the, the, the uh, federal exemptions that people can work under, uh, people looking at doing retail exempt uh, uh, entry into slaughter and, and uh, entry into commerce for the red meat kinds of things. So when we look at all of this, I mean, we've all been just like paddling like blazes and we don't know how long this is gonna last and we didn't know how long it was gonna last. And like Rosanna said, you know, her 30 day plan turned into a 60 day plan, turned into a six month plan. And I've never seen a, a year move as quickly as, as this one has. And I think when we wrap this year up and things draw to a close and we sort of say, you know, what are we going to do next and how do we want it to be? I think that's the big question. We can look outward and see all the stuff that, that's been happening. We can look in the middle grounds of how we in our smaller communities have adapted to what we needed to do to make things work in among and between ourselves. But I think when the when we when we figure out, you know, like what's Rosanna's 2021 gonna be like, I think the biggest thing that we can do right now is sit and ask ourselves really quietly, you know, how do we want it to be for our farms and our businesses and, and our communities? And I think that the thing that also comes with that question is what do I need to do? How do I need to show up? What do I need to, to be every day to create that? And that, that forces us to recognize things and that, that, understanding how our each unique individual desires and goals, no matter how we want it to be, we can then determine how we actually get there. We look at the, we spend so much time figuring out how to get there, how to get there, how to get there, and we forget to ask ourselves, where are we going? And my encouragement is let's ask ourselves, where are we going? And then figure out what do we have to do, whether being an, literally how do we have to act every day what kind of consumers and customers do we want to phone what are our roles in moving towards those goals and i think in the way that we each as individuals start to make choices and turn those choices into actions we can actually create this big vital organism of a regenerative viable farming ranching processing distribution networks and watersheds that that really work and I think when we take the time and the effort to do that, that that's the toughest work we're ever going to do. That internal reflection work that, that we all need to do is tougher than anything that, that any of us, I swear, have done this year. Um, and we realize then the power of those multiple, unique, and interrelated and consistently communicating parts and how we are able to see how are those all those parts function together and start to make a whole. And then that we can realize actually that society that we're creating here shares that pattern of other functional and vital landscapes and biological systems, like the farms that we work on, like the rumens of cows, all of those kinds of things that need diversity and cooperation and interaction and the really holistic view of order to how to get the job done. And I think that for me, that's where, and that's where it really looks. Um, what we really need to look at. The only thing that we can really control is what we do, how we respond to what's going on out there. And yeah, part of what we do is can, you know, to, to think locally, think in our, in our smaller places, but act globally, regionally, and, and that sort of stuff. And, and so I think as we start to put these next things together, we can really look tactically at, at, at what kind of a future we want to create. I honestly don't think, you know, everybody talks about, you know, is, is it going to get back to normal? And, and I hope it doesn't. Um, there were a lot of things that, that weren't, um, 
that didn't follow a lot of cadence and sensibility and 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 reality in in normal and and there were a lot of ways that things were propped up in unrealistic and unsustainable and and um, unreasonable manners and that didn't attract address things you know the holistic management guys we all talk about that triple bottom line of financial and environmental and and social things and i think this is a really good time to reflect on on that and just look at that that way that as as we look moving forward you know how do we want it to be this is a time you know maybe we've got a time to do a, a do-over and i would hope truly hope that none of us would be satisfied with with a return to normal and with that i just i'd love to open this up to, to discussion i think we've got a lot of interesting people in the in the group here we've got a lot of interesting people you know in on the call and i think we can have some creative discussion thank you sue thanks rosanna so the uh that that was um you know a good reminder for me as i go into my 2021 planning that I don't have to worry about what is going to happen and out guessing and trying to prophesy. Main thing is I just need to uh, keep track of what my goals are and my business mission. And, and that's really going to be my guiding star for heading into 2021. Um, now we have, and I figured it would be tight trying to transfer all these speakers in this little time. We don't have a, um, much allotted time left here. Um, for question and answers, the uh, question and answers, um, we also have a Zoom room opening up. Um, you'll see that in the chat box and you can click on that. And if uh, we can have, you'll be, I believe, unmuted there and we can have a more robust chat over there. Um, however, Emma, do we have um, some question and answers that you're wanting to take here or were we going to uh, shift those to the Zoom room? Hey, so we had one question come through, so I'm happy to share that with you now, or if you want to hear it and maybe take it to the Zoom room. Let's, let's hear it anyways, and we'll right. see. <laughs> so this came in from Bruce. Bruce asked about breakdown and processing capacities and shared how he was able to get dates for more animals by adding breakdown capacity to his business. So his question for you was, have you considered additional kill capacity beyond what you can process at your plant? And that's a good question, Bruce. I'm glad you were able to be on as a processor. So there's a couple of things. We were fortunate um, at our plant that my, as, as Mark mentioned in his presentation, there's only so many meat hooks um, out there. And the problem being is that um, cooling space for whole carcasses is a little bit like meat cutters. I can't just uh, those overhead rails, a freezer is really intensive to add on and, and you can't like rent a uh, reefer trailer that has hooks in there to, to hang uh, sides of beef or pork. So most, plant, most small plants around the nation, I think it would be true to say that their coolers, their hang coolers um, are typically at capacity. Most plants are um, already full on their hang and chill side. So that for most plants, it doesn't really help any to, I mean, if, to be able to kill more if you cut it up. However, um, it does eliminate that meat cutter um, that's in the plant. So for me, I've been really blessed and my cooler is actually oversized. And so I am getting to the point now to where I can do some kill and chill, but for most meat plants across the nation that hasn't hasn't been very helpful because they were already at capacity and you can't just rent one. Um, I would say if that's, that's the short answer. Uh, the speakers are um, not required to be in the chat room either, just so everybody knows. We just wanted to give people the, a chance to chat with each other. Um, and if any of the speakers are available, that's great too. I don't have anything more to say here in conclusion. Don, did you have something? Except thank you everybody for showing up and for giving your time for this. Um, I know as a farmer to butcher, those evenings are rare. Go ahead, Don. Thank you, Rosanna. What a wonderful list of speakers. And thanks for covering me at the beginning. I was the one who's supposed to talk about asking the questions and the questions and answer, but I dropped the ball. Uh, 
I uh, just want to encourage everyone to go to our Kansas Farmers Union website, kansasfarmersunion.com, to register for the remaining upcoming two sessions on the next two Thursday evenings, the Farm Fresh and the National Farmers Union. So, and this will be available for viewing shortly. So, thank you all so much for participating, and good night. Thank you, guys.